Good morning. This is Dr. Tom Johnson at uh, Best Palmer Institute. I'm going to be talking about an update on malignant orbital tumors of childhood. And I have no financial disclosures. So proptosis in childhood is something that's very concerning. It can be due to infectious causes like orbital cellulitis, traumatic um, injuries, and neoplastic uh, process such as benign and malignant tumors. So we're going to concentrate on the malignant tumors. Um, most orbital tumors of childhood in developed countries are benign. Uh, the uh, majority are cystic lesions and vascular lesions. And um, so when we evaluate a child who has proptosis, we have to take a careful history, uh, look at vital signs, do a careful eye exam, and of course, a systemic exam looking for skin lesions, masses, congenital anomalies. So malignant orbital tumors of childhood that I'm going to briefly discuss are the following, rhabdomyosarcoma, metastatic tumors, which I've listed, and secondary retinoblastoma. And you can see this child with acute proptosis of the right eye with downward displacement, which was a rhabdomyosarcoma. So a sarcoma is any tumor involving the bone, muscle, or other connective tissue. Um, rhabdo means rod-shaped, myo is uh, muscle, and a sarcoma is a type of uh, cancer. So um, during fetal development, uh, rhabdomyoblasts later become skeletal muscle cells. When these cells multiply or abnormally, a rhabdomyosarcoma may develop. So we'll start with rhabdomyosarcoma, the most common malignant orbital tumor of childhood. This is a child who presented to me with a rhabdomyosarcoma, um, downward displacement of his right eye, painless progressive proptosis. And this is the most common malignant orbital tumor of childhood. It comprises about 5 to 8% of childhood cancers. The average age of onset is somewhere between 7 and 8. Patients usually present with a painless progressive proptosis. There's a predilection for the superior orbit, especially in the embryonal subtype, which is the most common subtype. The good thing about rhabdomyosarcoma is that even though it's a malignant tumor, the survival rate is over 90% if it's caught when the tumor is um, has not progressed. So the uh, presentation, there's rapid onset of progressive painless proptosis, ptosis, chemosis, decreased motility. There's a predilection for the superior orbit and can present inferiorly also in the alveolar subtype. This is a patient with a 45D history of a uh, slowly progressive um, proptosis of the um, right eye um, without uh, pain. So the differential diagnosis includes orbital cellulitis, idiopathic orbital inflammation, neuroblastoma, which is often bilateral, ruptured dermoid cyst, Langerhans histocytosis, and leukemic infiltrate. So some of the other things that can cause orbital tumors, which may be confused with rhabdomyosarcoma, include infantile hemangiomas. These are benign hamartomas, tumors composed of tissue normally found at the involved site. They grow rapidly during the first one to two years of life, and then they spontaneously involute over um, the next five to seven years. They can cause amblyopia, as you can see in this child, by occlusion of the visual axis or the induction of astigmatism. This child has multiple hemangiomas, but one large lid and orbital mass, as you can see here. On, this is a CT scan. We usually don't do CT scans. At this point, this is an older patient. Um, but you can see there's this large um, lesion involving the orbit extending toward the apex that enhances readily with contrast due to the uh, high vascularity of this, this hemangioma. Lymphangiomas also can present with acute onset of proptosis. These are benign hamartomas as well. They present in slightly older children or young adults. Again, patients may present with a rapid onset of proptosis and ecchymosis, especially after trauma. These tumors can infiltrate into normal structures. They're not encapsulated, so they are very difficult to treat and excise. They may grow during respiratory infections. And as I mentioned, they're impossible to completely um, excise. So we have different treatments for them these days. Usually we inject these tumors 
with sclerosing agents. This patient is a young boy that has a um, acute onset of proptosis and you can see bluish discoloration of his left lower lid. And on his CT scan, he has this multi-lobulated lesion, which is a lymphangioma. And these days, the treatment of choice is to aspirate the fluid from these and inject a sclerosing agent such as uh, bleomycin. So they can uh, present acutely with proptosis, um, kind of similar to rhabdomyosarcoma. This is a patient that had a known lymphangioma of his right orbit, and this is after he had some trauma playing football with an acute hemorrhage into the lymphangioma with bleed. So this can be very dangerous as it can compress the optic nerve and needs to be treated urgently with drainage of this, um, this bleed into the tumor. Plexiform neurofibromas are also benign neurotumors seen most commonly in neurofibromatosis type one. They can involve the upper eyelid and the anterior orbit. These are vascular, uh, very infiltrative structures. They can cause this, uh, significant deformity and they're also impossible to completely excise due to the uh, infiltrative nature of these lesions. This is a young girl that has a large plexiform neurofibroma with neurofibromatosis type one. She also has a buthalmic eye due to uveal uh, neurofibroma. And you can see this tumor extends into the orbit and into the eyelid causing this type of swelling. She has the absence of the greater wing of sphenoid as well. Optic nerve gliomas can also present um, with slow progressive proptosis, um, painless. Uh, they may be associated with neurofibromatosis or occur in isolation. They can cause progressive proptosis. They often cause strabismus and visual loss. On exam, there may be swelling of the optic disc, decreased motility. Um, treatment is usually observation and lists the uh, tumors threatening to extend intracranially or involve the opposite optic nerve, and then they are usually excised. So this is a patient with that uh, tumor. Here's a patient with um, optic nerve glioma. You can see the proptosis of the left side. And on this um, MRI scan, you can see this fusiform shaped tumor of the optic nerve. And this is another uh, patient with a fusiform optic nerve glioma of the right orbit. Eosinophil granuloma is another tumor that can't be mistaken for a malignant tumor. It's a benign uh, destructive tumor. It's part of the uh, non-Langerhans cell histiocytosis group of uh, diseases. It usually occurs at the superior lateral rim. It can cause bony destruction, and it can be confused with a malignant tumor. Tumor is composed of eosinophils and histiocytes, and the treatment usually involves curatage, steroids, and sometimes chemotherapy. This is a young patient who was referred to me with a um, diagnosis of possible rhabdomyosarcoma. You can see this patient has proptosis of the right eye. And on his CT scan, he has this large orbital mass eroding uh, bone of the sphere lateral orbit and extending at the orbit. This ended up being a um, eosinophilic granuloma, which was treated with curatage and, um, and steroids. So this is, I'll just show you some of the uh, classic uh, histopathology of these uh, eosinophilic cells, multiple eosinophils, histocytes comprising this eosinophilic granuloma. You can see the eosinophils here and the histocytes in this area. So fibrous dysplasia is uh, one last tumor that can be mistaken for rhabdomyosarcoma. It's a benign fibroosseous hamartoma, usually occurs in the first two decades of life. It uh, is uh, uh, thought to be due to the interruption of the maturation of the bone at the woven stage. It can be either monoostotic with just one uh, lesion or polyostotic with multiple in Albright syndrome, and it can compress the optic canal or enlarge abruptly uh, when accompanied by an aneurysmal bone cyst. This is a young boy that had uh, slow painless proptosis of his left eye, you can see, and on his scan here, um, C, uh, CT scan um, without uh, contrast, you can see this large bony mass involving the skull base and the lateral orbital wall. And on the bone window, you can see it has a ground class appearance, which is characteristic of uh, fibrous dysplasia. So let's get back to rhabdomyosarcoma. We've talked about the things that can be mistaken for it. Um, what are the risk factors for developing this most common tumor of childhood? Um, 
there are thought to be several radiation exposure in utero, um, accelerated fetal growth. Um, there has been a study uh, about parents taking rec recreational drugs during the uh, pregnancy, such as cocaine and marijuana, that may be a risk factor. It uh, may uh, lower socioeconomic status may be a risk uh, factor, as well as antibiotic therapy soon after birth. There are also heritable syndromes associated with rhabdomyosarcoma, and I've listed them here in this uh, column. You can see there's multiple syndromes that can be also associated with rhabdomyosarcoma. So the, um, the study on the parents' uh, drug use um, is right here. This uh, gives a two to uh, five-fold increased risk of um, rhabdomyosarcoma when the parents use cocaine and marijuana during pregnancy. Um, the, uh, during the year preceding the child's birth. And this was published uh, several years ago. So imaging um, for uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, we could either do a CT scan or an MRI scan. I think these days we mostly do MRI scans just because of the um, less uh, risk of radiation uh, uh, to the um, growing tissues in these patients. So MRI scan is a preferred. When I first started working, we did CT scans often because MRI scans were not that available. So some of my slides do have CT scans, but MRI scan is really the, the uh, imaging uh, modality of choice. On MRI, these uh, tumors are relatively, relatively isodense on T1 weighted images and slightly hyper intense on T2. And here you can see um, T1 and T2 of a rhabdomyosarcoma of the right orbit. You can see here it's iso intense on the uh, T1 weighted and slightly hyper intense on T2. Um, this is a CT of an embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. And the thing that I think is important to note in this slide is the tumor usually in its early stages does not erode bone and actually interacts very benignly with the bone. There's not bony erosion and so forth. It does have a mass effect causing proptosis. It conforms to the shape of the bone has a predilection for the superior orbit in the most common subtype, which is the embryonal subtype. So this is a, a coronal uh, um, T1 and T2 with and without contrast. You can see these tumors can enhance readily with contrast. Um, this is a patient we saw recently who had uh, solely progressive proptosis of his left eye. He had an intraocular pressure of 31. Pupils were normal, he had proptosis, he had lateral displacement of his eye. You can see, see he has some mild erythema and some contractival injection and a little bit of inferior chemosis. And on the, the scan on this patient, you can see a, a T1 with and without contrast. Again, a very large medial mass extending deep into the orbit, which does enhance with contrast administration. So the management of rhabdomyosarcoma includes first a thorough history and physical examination. We as ophthalmologists uh, perform a prompt biopsy. If we can safely debulk the lesion without damaging the adjacent structures, we do that. Then we refer the patient uh, as soon as possible to pediatric oncology um, for systemic workup as well as um, uh, consideration for radiation uh, therapy. Um, when we do the biopsy, usually we find a um, small blue cell tumor. We do a, on this patient, we did a lid crease incision, took a biopsy. We see a small blue cell tumor, um, and that can uh, narrow the differential down to rhabdomyosarcoma, neuroblastoma, as well as several other uh, tumors, including Ewing sarcoma, lymph lymphoma, retinoblastoma. So we usually just make a skin crease incision do a biopsy and um, do a frozen section at a time we do the biopsy to get a good idea that we are intralesional and also um, we have a small blue cell tumor. Get the patient to pediatric oncology um, as we're waiting for the final pathology to um, arrive. So the histopathology is interesting. Um, we see um, round to oval hyperchromatic nuclei with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, mitotic figures, and we use immunostains often to make this diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma. But this, these are just some slides of the uh, histopathology. You can see these uh, tadpole-shaped cells with this kind of loose eosinophilic cytoplasm, 
hyperchromatic nuclei um, uh, and um, this streaming uh, cytoplasm. And you can see on this lower power view, this um, abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, uh, mitotic figures, hyperchromatic nuclei uh, as well. So we use immu immunohistochemistry often in making the diagnosis on these uh, patients. Um, so the, um, the stains we usually use are a myogen stain. You can see it's staining positive here in this uh, slide, and a Desmond stain is staining positive here. And these are markers for rhabdomyosarcoma that helps uh, differentiate this from other small blue cell tumors of the orbit. Um, other syndromes or other uh, um, things can um, appear to be rhabdomyosarcoma that aren't. Um, it can masquerade as a chalazin. This is a patient I saw that presented with swelling of her left upper eyelid. Um, and you can see she was referred to me for a chalazin. And when I looked at her lid carefully, she did have this um, lid lesion here, but she also has uh, a mass in this area. We were suspicious that this was not a chalazin, so we did a uh, imaging study. And one can see here, she does have a mass extending into the orbit. And this ended up being an alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, the second most common subtype of this uh, <clears throat> tumor. So the two main histological subtypes in uh, rhabdomyosarcoma are the embryonal, uh, which is the most common at about 80%, which has a higher instance in younger children, and alveolar, which is less common, about 20%, but tends to be more aggressive. It tends to be more resistant to chemotherapy, and their survival rate is usually lower. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. And then the pleomorphic subtype is uh, uh, benign and usually uh, affects adults. And there's also a botryoid subtype that doesn't really occur in the orbital area. So one thing we look at these days for prognosis of these studies is uh, fusion genes. Um, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma is a more aggressive cancer. And the uh, cells demonstrate a uh, unique uh, chromosome translocation, especially at the PAX3 FOX1 and PAX7 FOX1 fusion genes. So to study this, we do a FISH study. It's called fluorescence in situ hybridization. So um, when uh, one study looked at uh, 52 um, sarcomas looking for these fusion genes, they found uh, the, the, uh, the gene present in 25 cases of alveolar eight of uh, embryonal, one neuroblastoma, and other 16. So um, the Fox gene arrangements are usually found in about 88% of alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma patients. So this is, again, the signature genetic change that's found in, in alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. And the, res, uh, the fusion gene results from this uh, reciprocal translocation of chromosomes 2 and 13. Staging of rhabdomyosarcoma is uh, the following. If it's a, a group one tumor, that means it's a localized disease completely resected. So if we had a tumor just in the orbit that we could completely resect, that would be group one. Group two, if there's regional disease grossly resected, um, and that could be an orbital mass where we were able to remove the majority of it, but not the whole thing. Um, Group three is uh, gross residual disease after surgery. And a lot of the orbital rhabdomyosarcoma patients are group three patients. And group four are those patients with metastatic disease. So the treatment is based on the clinical staging that we just talked about. Um, group one patients may just receive chemotherapy only. Um, group two, two may, uh, uh, also receive um, chemotherapy and some radiation therapy, you know, in a lower dose of 36 gray. Group three, if there's gross residual disease, this is a very common outcome after we biopsy these very large orbital masses. You get a combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy at a little higher dose, about 45 gray. And group four, with, when they have distant metastases uh, present at the onset, you get a combination of intensive chemotherapy and um, radiation therapy. So the chemotherapy regimens vary, 
and there's a lot of new treatments coming down the line. This is uh, coordinated with the pediatric oncologist, but the traditional agents are uh, VAC, that's been christine, actinomycin, and cyclophosphide. Newer uh, agents are being used like etoposide, ifosamide, uh, uh, topotecan, um, other ones in, in higher risk or refractory cases. Radiation therapy, we've talked about, usually about 3,500 to 5,000 grays in fractionated dosage. Proton beam is a newer form of radiation therapy that has less collateral damage, fewer side effects, so that's used when we can, uh, when we can use it. Exenderation is not used in rhabdomyosarcoma very much anymore. In the past, um, in the 60s and so forth, um, patients uh, were often exenderated with a survival rate uh, very low. These days, we only use exoneration for those cases refractory to chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and the survival rate can be quite high, um, up to 71% at three years when the tumor is confined to the orbit, uh, when it's also combined with chemotherapy. So proton beam therapy is uh, a new type of ionizing radiation using protons, it uh, has very little uh, lateral scatter to the, the brain tissues and the pituitary gland. Um, so it, um, the, the tissues deep to the tumor receive very few uh, of the protons, so very small amount of radiation. So this reduces the risk of secondary malignancy. It tends to be a more expensive um, type of treatment. There's only a few centers in the world that have this and uh, can be expensive. So the intergroup rhabdomyosarcoma study group uh, defines standard therapy as VAC, vincristine, actinomycin, and cyclophosphamide. Um, High-risk groups, again, are receiving these newer agents that we uh, talked about. Um, bone marrow transplant um, has failed to improve the prognosis in those patients with distant metastases. So the prognosis, again, is excellent if the tumor is treated while still confined to the orbit. The survival rate is over 93% at five years. Embryonal rate has the best survival rate, um, and it comprises about 80% of cases, and the five-year five survival rate of embryonal is about 94%. And alveolar, alveolar cell has the worst prognosis with a five-year survival rate of about 74%. This is a patient that I took care of that was actually had a group one disease where the, this patient had a rhabdomyosarcoma inferior orbit that we were able to completely excise um, without any residual disease. So these are rare, but they do occur. The treatment side effects are usually uh, due to the radiation therapy and it's confined to the orbit. Patients develop dry eye, corneal scarring, uh, cataract most commonly, um, very often, um, these, these patients need cataract surgery later on. It's very rare for them to develop radiation retinitis and optic neuropathy uh, with radiation treatments these days. In the past, sometimes the radiation would actually result in a blind, painful eye, and the patient uh, would develop neovascular glaucoma. But with newer radiation protocols, there are fewer side effects, especially with proton beam. It gives less uh, collateral damage um, less radiation to the pineal gland and the brain tissues, less risk for um, secondary uh, tumors. So what's new in rhabdomyosarcoma? Newer molecular genetic techniques um, allow uh, us to know which patients will respond to different treatments, better radiation treatments, um, including proton beam, limiting chemotherapy for lower risk tumors, and newer medications, IGF-1 receptor inhibitors, drugs that inhibit the tumor's ability to make blood vessels such as we use in ophthalmology, Vastin, and drugs that target the mTOR protein and the ALK protein also are being tried for treatment of uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. So I'm going to go on to another tumor that is less common, but it's also one we see in ophthalmology, metastatic neuroblastoma. This is a tumor that um, is a metastatic tumor from another area. Um, these patients usually present early in life in the first two years of life. Um, the most common origin of the primary tumor is the adrenal gland, and they, these tumors can also originate in the retroperitoneal area, 
the mediastinal and cervical ganglia. So these patients are unique and oftentimes they have a bilateral presentation. This is a patient that had a subtype of neuroblastoma, metastatic ganglial neuroblastoma. And she presented to me with one of the characteristic findings of neuroblastoma, which is proptosis and ecchymosis of the eyelids. These tumors grow rapidly, outgrow their blood supply, and cause bleeding and some ecchymosis in the eyelids. So you can see this young girl that has this tumor, and she could see on her scan, this tumor is pretty extensive. It um, metastasizes to the bone of the lateral orbit and extends all the way up her skull. This was the biopsy that we took showing these ganglion cells and these, uh, these neuroblastoma cells intermixed. So this was a ganglion neuroblastoma. The, um, so metastatic neuroblastoma often causes bilateral orbital metastases. So rhabdomyosarcoma hardly ever does that. It's very common in neuroblastoma to cause bilateral orbital metastases. These patients have a characteristic finding, which is eyelid ecchymosis when they present with proptosis. Not all of them have this, of course. Urine catecholamines are positive in a large number of these patients, so we always test for urine catecholamines. Orbital disease, when they present to us, is usually stage four. <clears throat> it historically has had a poor prognosis, but the prognosis has increased or has improved recently due to better chemotherapy and radiation um, regimens. Um, there may be a chromosome CPIX22 genetic variation associated with this disease. So this is a one um, and a half year old, an 18 month old a child I saw who came to me with uh, ecchymosis and proptosis of his left eye brought in by his parents. And you can see this patient has a tumor that has a predilection for the superior lateral orbit. And you can see it involves the bone. The bone is increased in uh, density and size, and the tumor extends into the orbit, as well as intracranially in this uh, one spot. And you can see this ecchymosis a little more carefully. On biopsy, it's a small blue cell tumor. And so this is, uh, again, when we do a frozen section, you usually get the diagnosis of a small blue cell tumor. And then further studies are needed to differentiate this tumor. <clears throat> the most common place of origin of the um, tumor is the uh, adrenal gland. You can see this is the mass here in the abdomen, which was the uh, origin of the metastatic neuroblastoma. So this is another child I saw and who had kind of a similar picture. He had a subconjunctival hemorrhage, some ecchymosis of his uh, lid on the right side, proptosis, and you can see this um, outward and downward displacement of his right eye. Again, a young child less than two years of age presented like this with a history of incidental trauma, which was, of course, not related to this. When we look at his scan, again, this is a patient from many years ago, so he had a CT scan. You see this patient has bilateral orbital masses, uh, involvement of the skull base, and also the temporalis muscle. You can actually see this temporalis swelling on this side and see the bilaterality of this tumor. Again, this is uh, metastatic neuroblastoma from the abdomen. Um, so the patient was treated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And at this stage, um, usually the prognosis historically has been poor, but it has improved in recent years due to better uh, regimens for chemotherapy and, and radiation therapy. So very rarely uh, rep, uh, metastatic neuroblastoma can be seen at birth. This is a patient that I was called to the um, um, uh, neonatal intensive care unit. This patient was born with this large mass. You can see the eye is completely proptotic, uh, very large orbital mass. You can see the eye is being compressed by this huge lesion. Uh, we actually took this lesion out. It was a, a metastatic neuroblastoma. This patient had multiple uh, metastases, systemic metastases, and unfortunately, passed away due to his uh, disease. So the treatment um, of this tumor is uh, stratified based on the clinical features, age and the sta staging. Um, these days it's a combination of chemo, radiation, surgery, stem cell transplant, immunotherapy. Many chemotherapy agents are used. And I've listed them here, some of the same ones as in rhabdo. 
cyclophosphamide, big christine, atopicide, garboplatin, doxorubicin. Um, if the patient has specific gene genetic mutations, uh, targeted molecular therapy is being used for those patients. Prognosis is more age dependent and in infants uh, to five years these days. This is from 2023. The um, survival rate is about 85%, but in children um, um, uh, greater than one year, 45%. A couple other tumors um, that are much less common include the Ewing's uh, sarcoma group of tumors. These are also included in the family of primitive uh, peripheral neuroectodermal family of tumors. And um, these can include Ewing sarcoma, which is the one we often see involving the orbit. Not often, but it's the one of these tumors that most commonly affects the orbit. Primitive neuroectodermal tumor and the Askin tumor, which is uh, more of a pulmonary type of tumor. So this is one patient I saw with a uh, peripheral uh, neuroectodermal tumor involving the um, sinus, the maxillary sinus, the nose, and the orbit in a young teenage uh, girl. Again, this is also a systemic uh, metastatic disease. Oftentimes these occur um, primarily in the long bones of the limbs and metastasize, and again, treated with chemo and uh, radiation therapy. So UN sarcoma is one that can involve the orbit. It's rare, it's a mainly metastasis from a distant site. Treated with surgery, chemo, radiation, survival rate is about uh, 50% in these, uh, these patients. <clears throat> An interesting tumor is granulocytic sarcoma. This is another tumor that can have a slow progressive proptosis, painless. It can be bilateral, um, more commonly unilateral. It's a variant of a, a acute myeloid leukemia, AML. Um, it can also be known by the name of chloroma because in the tumor cells, there is a myeloperoxidase and that imparts a green hue to the tumor cells. This um, tumor is associated with leukemia, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, and can present either before the onset of leukemia, during the uh, treatment of leukemia, or even after uh, the uh, tumor or leukemia has been diagnosed. Uh, for some reason, this is more common in the uh, Middle East than Asia and Africa. So I've seen uh, several of these patients. This is a patient who presented to me with uh, slowly progressive proptosis of his right eye. He had no diagnosis uh, before of any systemic disease. You can see his eye is pushed out and down, and he has quite a bit of proptosis, chemosis, conjunctival injection, some tearing. And then when I did a CT scan, you could see he has this very large orbital mass, uh, kind of fuse form, um, and smooth borders extending down into the apex of the orbit. This was biopsied and was found to be a uh, granulocytic sarcoma. The pathology, uh, it can be similar to uh, large cell lymphoma. It has uh, These tumor cells have small cytoplasmic granules, the leader stain uh, is uh, for identification of esterase is used uh, in the uh, diagnosis of these tumors. So this is just the histopathology of this, again, this small uh, blue cell tumor, which is a granulocytic sarcoma. Um, you can see this leader stain positive for these, uh, these granules in the, in the tumor cells. We just had one uh, similar patient recently that Baskin Palmer had presented. Um, had a history of acute myeloid leukemia in a 15-month-old uh, female. She presented with bilateral uh, proptosis, um, uh, periorbital edema, uh, as you can see in, in this uh, clinical slide. And on her MRI scan, you could see bilateral fusiform orbital masses extending back into the, uh, deep into the orbit. And uh, again, a very smooth appearance, similar to that uh, last uh, patient that we showed. And so AML um, is a type of leukemia that only represents about 20% of acute pediatric leukemias. ALL is much more common, acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. The survival rate is about 70%. The treatment of this tumor includes chemotherapy, uh, including four to five cycles. Um, these are some of the agents that are used. 
Stem cell transplant is often used in these patients. Um, and then uh, gene mutation targeted therapies are now being uh, applied based on next generation sequencing. This is that same patient showing a CT scan of this uh, tumor on the right side. So again, there's oftentimes bilateral involvement in this uh, disease as well. You can see bilateral uh, fusiform orbital masses uh, in this patient with acute uh, myelogenous leukemia. And again, on this scan, you can see these uh, large bilateral masses um, <clears throat> and also involvement of the skull base in this uh, patient. So this patient was treated with um, chemo and, um, and is doing a uh, doing well at this point. So secondary tumors are those tumors that are find, defined as tumors that extend into the um, orbit from other structures. Uh, they can extend from the perinasal sinuses, from the skin, from the nose, but they're also considered tumors that extend from the eye into the orbit. So secondary retinoblastoma is a type of tumor that um, starts in the eye and then uh, it left untreated, it can the road through the eye and extend to the orbit. Um, and so these are usually neglected cases uh, with delay in presentation. Um, the prognosis is poor, the treatment's mainly palliative. Um, when I worked in Saudi Arabia many years ago, this was the most common um, malignant tumor childhood in, in Saudi Arabia. And also there was a study out of Pakistan that showed in that location, it was also the most common malignant um, orbital tumor. So. This is a young girl that uh, I saw when I was in Saudi Arabia who had a very large um, uh, retinoblastoma of her right uh, of her left orbit. You could see this tumor extending out quite far. Um, it's really destroyed the ocular structures. You can see here it's very large orbital mass extending back toward the apex and no real recognizable optic, uh, or, um, ocular structures. And she also has retinoblastoma of her right eye pretty extensive with leukocoria. And we can see on the CT scan here, she has uh, diffuse calcifications in her um, right eye. So again, this pretends a very, very poor uh, prognosis uh, for uh, secondary orbital retinoblastoma. So um, I'm gonna go into my um, questions now. So the first question is the most common Histological subtype of rhabdomyosarcoma is alveolar, embryonal, botryoid, or none of the above. Good. Uh, most of you got that right. Embryonal is the most common type. Alveolar is the second most common type. Uh, botryoid and, and none of the above are not correct, but about 80% of embryonal or rhabdomyosarcomas are the embryonal uh, subtype. Okay, so let's go on to question two. Okay, question two. Which genetic change is most commonly found in alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma? Application of the, of the MCYN oncogene to the PAX3 FOX1 fusion gene, three, the uh, CBFB MYH11 translocation, and four, all of the above. Very good. So it's a PAX3 FOX1 fusion gene, and that um, occurs in um, most of the alveolar type rhabdomyosarcoma. So when we biopsy these tumors, of course, we send all the histopathology to, um, to pathology, and um, we do the uh, straight H&E study. We look at the immunohistochemistry for Desmond, Myogen, and there are some other markers we use for rhabdomyosarcoma, and then we send for the FISH study to look for the, uh, the uh, fusion gene. So we're gonna go on to the third question now. This is a little tricky, but um, not really. Which of the following pediatric orbital tumors is most likely to present with bilateral orbital involvement? But you only have these choices. You have metastatic neuroblastoma, granulocytic sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and lymphangioma, the most common. Correct. Metastatic neuroblastoma is the most common. And I, I find that really most of these have bilateral involvement. Um, 
In AML, it can be bilateral as well, but I think it's more common in metastatic neuroblastoma. Um, I've never seen a bilateral rhabdomyosarcoma. I'm sure they could occur in uh, untreated cases, but I've never seen it. Um, and I've never seen that happen in lymphadenoma as well. So metastatic neuroblastoma is the one that most commonly can have bilateral involvement. And the thing to remember about the metastatic neuroblastoma, it's usually lateral in the orbit. It's usually a superior lateral tumor that can cause bony changes, bony erosions, and so forth. Granulocytic sarcoma can cause bilateral involvement, but it's much less commonly associated with bony changes of the orbit. Rhabdomyosarcoma usually does not present bilaterally, and it doesn't usually, when we diagnose it, have any bony changes to the orbit. And lymphangioma as well does not um, usually occur bilaterally and does not have um, bony changes uh, as well. Uh, here are the questions. Hi, there's a long uh, list of blue cell tumors, differential diagnosis. It's uh, same, we get our histopath reports, how to narrow down with such report and what to request the pathologist to help us specifically. Okay, so there is a long list, um, you know, and so it can be very confusing. When I first do a biopsy, I wanna make sure I'm interlesional, especially if the tumor is in a, a difficult location, I wanna make sure I have the tumor. So um, since I've taken the patient to um, surgery, so to narrow down the differential, um, clinical um, findings, I, you know, we do a whole uh, eye exam on, examination on the patient. I usually palpate the, the abdomen. If there's anything that looks, you know, uh, suspicious for metastatic disease and so forth, you know, you may scan the abdomen, so forth. Um, uh, urine catecholamines are used in, you know, to look for um, metastatic neuroblastoma. Um, but I do rely on my pathologist to do a lot of stains like um, immunohistochemistry. Um, also, you know, they could do a genetic study of the, of the tumor to really narrow down the differential diagnosis and find out um, uh, what is going on. Um, so, you know, I rely a lot on pathology, uh, systemic evaluation, especially patients with AML, you know, may have blood or bone marrow signs of uh, acute my, uh, myeloid leukemia, but they may not uh, at that point. So, um, so we look at our special stains and immunohistochemistry and, uh, and molecular genetic studies of these tumors as well to help differentiate the diagnosis. Um, sometimes it can be difficult if you don't have, you know, those techniques. I think probably the, um, the easiest ones are immunostains um, to look for different uh, markers, like in, say, in rhabdomyosarcoma, you can look at Desmond, Myogen, and so forth, and that will help narrow down that differential diagnosis. But that can be, can be very tough. So uh, VAC stands for, um, this is another question, um, then Christine. Um, adriamycin and cyclophosphamide. Um, it's uh, the um, the kind of characteristic classic um, chemotherapy for rhabdomyosarcoma. Is there any role of uh, visual acuity in staging of disease rhabdomyosarcoma? If there is visual uh, acuity present, is it just about to examine? Okay, any role of visual acuity in staging? Um, I you know I don't think it's really necessary to do um, exoneration. It doesn't really improve the prognosis, I think, because there's often micrometastases at the time of the disease. So I think patients, you know, benefit from chemotherapy and good chemotherapy regimens. You know, if it's, if it's a large tumor that has not been able to be at least grossly resected, radiation therapy, but I only use exoneration in refractory cases where they failed chemotherapy, radiation therapy, it continues to grow. Um, I do this in conjunction with a pediatric oncologist. We usually present the patient at tumor board. We go over all our options. Um, and then I've only had a handful of cases where I've actually had to accentuate patients with rhabdomyosarcoma. And when I do, the patients usually are still followed by oncology. They get in uh, chemotherapy after the, the um, accentuation, and they usually do fairly well, but I have had I did have one patient who uh, actually came to me from um, another country, and she had failed chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and and we presented her tumor board, and we did exoneration, 
gave her more chemotherapy, everything, but unfortunately she passed away from the disease. So, um, <clears throat> so it's, it's very rarely used. Again, I've only done a hand, I've seen, you know, a lot, a lot of cases of rhabdomyosarcoma. I've only exonerated a few of them. I could actually count them on one hand, I think. So uh, in OPG, do you look for gangrene cells to decide treatment um, or uh, take into account visual acuity and, and visual fields? Um, so um, with, uh, I think you're talking about the neuroblastoma, um, you know, I'm not sure what is, is meant by the OPG. Okay. Okay, can I, can I tumors be treated any advanced technology? I mean, yes, eye tumors can be can be treated. I mean, we we treat treat all of them basically. We um we try to tailor our treatment to the specific tumor, such as rhabdo may have a different tumor from metastatic neuroblastoma, especially from uh, granulocytic sarcoma or even Ewing sarcoma. They all have different treatments. There's different treatment protocols based on the tumor type and based on the age of the patient and based on on the staging of the, of the tumor. So um, we usually are instrumental in making the diagnosis of the tumor. We are the patients uh, usually present to us first, and they come to us with proptosis or uh, just an orbital mass and so forth. And so we work them up initially. We do the complete eye exam. We do imaging studies. We do a uh, prompt biopsy. We do the histopathology, and we try to find out as much as possible what is going on, and then. Almost all these patients with malignant tumors will need to see pediatric oncology. They have a lot of new targeted molecular uh, genetic techniques using monoclonal antibodies um, against different, um, you know, molecular genetic molecular genetic changes that can really improve the prognosis. There's a lot of research being performed. The rhabdomyosarcoma study group has been going on for years and years, and they're always looking. At new agents, newer treatments with less side effects, uh, giving better prognosis. So it's always a work in progress. Uh, and um, and we follow the patients along after the treatment starts because a lot of times patients get radiation side effects or so forth. They get cataracts, they may get dry eye, they need to be followed by us. We follow them for any recurrence in the orbit. If they do have a possible recurrence, we oftentimes re biopsy them to see if that is active tumor or just a uh, uh, necrose tumor that has, still shows up on imaging scans. So, so risk factors of Ewing sarcoma. Um, that that's a good question. It's a it's a rare tumor. I I think you know uh, genetic risk factors. There are genetic um, you know diseases. Uh, this peripheral neuro ectodermal group of tumors has different, uh, are associated with different gene mutations. Um, so it's probably mostly genetic, could be from, you know, uh, intrauterine uh, radiation and so forth, but it's such a rare tumor. I don't know if I can specifically tell you other environmental risk factors that are associated with that. Can we join the rhabdomyosarcoma study group? If yes, how? Um, that's a good question. I think it's, it's a group of scientists who get together and actually study rhabdomyosarcoma and, um, and mostly uh, oncologists. Um, I, I'm not a member of the rhabdomyosarcoma study group. I, I've read a lot of their, their papers, a lot of their works. I don't know how one becomes a member. I don't know if it's by invitation. Um, I, you know, I think you probably could. Um, I would Probably con look at look them up online, contact them, and see what the uh, requirements are to become a member. Okay, this is another one. Great presentation, thank you, sir. I'd like to know your opinion about the choice of neuroimaging for orbital tumors. Good question. I think MRI should be done to reduce radiation exposure and risk of secondary tumors. But I saw the CT scan was done. Yeah, I mean a lot of those cases where I had the CT scan, I worked in Saudi Arabia from 1986 to 92. And at that time, when I worked there, we only had CT scan available. Um, we didn't have MRI at that time. So that's why MRI scans were the, the, the imaging modality used. These days at Baskin Palmer, um, I usually use uh, MRI uh, 
scans for the reasons you outlined. There's less of a risk of radiation therapy and secondary tumors uh, because uh, MRI does not involve radiation. So um, I, I definitely prefer that. Um, oftentimes, it's, since we're a referral center, we are referred patients in from the outside and the patients will bring their own scans. So sometimes a patient will have had a, radi or a uh, CT scan done on the outside and then if the CT scan shows me everything I need to know, I, I can use that. But if they've already had it done they, and they come in with it, then we, we use that scan. But I agree with you 100%. Um, MRI scan, uh, if at all possible, it reduces the risk of radiation and secondary tumors. Okay. Um, how do we deal with a patient with astrocytoma? Um, I, I presume you mean an orbital astrocytoma. Um, I think, you know, it, it depends on the location, the size of the tumor. I would try to um, excise it. I just had a patient recently that had a, a massive orbital astrocytoma. Um, and we ended up, the patient was no light perception and the tumor would uh, constantly bleed. And we ended up accentuating the patient. He actually had metastatic disease. So he was also being treated at this time uh, with um, chemotherapy as well. And I accentuated the orbit. So it depends on the size of the tumor and the, um, you know, the, the malignancy of the tumor, how that would be treated. Okay. Any final examination tip for primary care, primary eye care provider to detect these tumors early? Well, that's a great question. Um, sometimes it's hard to detect them early um, because patients may not have any pain. Sometimes it's a very slow onset painless proptosis. And usually um, it, uh, patients come in when the tumor is noticeable to the parents or it's causing any type of problem. So, um, you know, you, when you do a complete eye exam, you can do a Hertel X ophthalmometer. You can, you know, look at the uh, projection of the eyes, see if there's any um, abnormal projection of one eye versus the other. Some of these tumors may actually cause um, an induced um, hyperopia due to pressure on the back of the eye, causing shortening of the eye and an induced hyperopia. So if you see a patient that has uh, a lot more hyperopia on one side than the other, then you might want to scan the patient to see if there is something behind the eye pressing up against the eye or swelling of the optic disc or swelling of the, uh, the retinal vessels may also be another sign that something is in the orbit pressing the, uh, the eye forward. Any decrease of motility, um, you know, you could also suspect something behind the eye. Um, and I think if you're suspicious, um, you know, if you're suspicious, there may be a tumor behind the eye, uh, an MRI scan. How can we, uh, how can we, choroidal nerve uh, tumor treat, treat steppers? I think we're talking about choroidal tumors here. So with the choroidal tumors, um, that's usually, um, it could be due to a metastatic disease. Um, and in my practice, those are usually uh, seen by the retina doctors to see what type of choroidal tumor they have, if it can be associated with a systemic disease or a choroidal metastasis. The patient gets a whole systemic workup looking for the primary, and they may need uh, radiation therapy for the intraocular tumor. Is there any form where we could uh, start multi central pearls ocular malignancy research? Um, I mean, here we have um, the uh, the American Society of Plastic Surgeon, we have a forum there. We also have the NASOS, which is the National Association, uh, Association of, of Orbital um, Academic Orbital Surgeons. NASOS, we have also a forum there. Um, I think there are several forums around the world with uh, orbital, orbital doctors who, who treat these problems, but those are the two local ones here that I participate in. Um, Oh, inter, there's some uh, question on intracarotid chemotherapy, I think. What is your experience of IAC for ret retinoblastoma? Um, I know it's done quite commonly at, at Baskin Palmer with very good results. Um, it is effective. So um, that's usually uh, performed by the, uh, the retina oncology service, but I've uh, been peripherally associated with uh, some of these patients. And they do quite well. So I think that's a very viable treatment for retinoblastoma. 
we use actually intracarotid chemotherapy often for um, lacrimal gland uh, tumors, lacrimal, lacrimal gland adenoid cystic carcinoma. We find it's uh, very, very helpful in adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland. Um, is it important to do zero MRI to see prognosis or if treatment is effective in retinomyosarcoma and uh, retinoblastoma? How often do you MRI in low-income uh, countries? You know, um, I usually don't do a lot of MRIs. Um, usually, after if, if I see a, a treatment response um, from the chemotherapy and radiation therapy, I follow the patient, and maybe we'll do another MRI scan um, in three months or so. And then if everything looks good, maybe in a year. I don't use them quite, you know, very often, um, unless I suspect there is not a good treatment response. Um, I'm working with an oncologist. Sometimes they do scan the patient um, and I follow the, the MRI scan there, but it's, uh, I know it's not, it's MRIs are expensive. So, um, I think, you know, if you're seeing a good clinical response, I would probably possibly do one MRI several months after the, you know, the treatment has been given. And then if all looks good, maybe, maybe once a year. Regarding, regarding abduction blindness or gaze of both visual loss, which tumor in practice is responsible for it. Gaze-induced visual loss. Um, I mean, it could be a, a lot of tumors, like abduction uh, deficits, um, you know, uh, can be due to any tumor that impinges on the uh, on the lateral rectus muscle, which could be um, rhabdomyosarcoma, it could be uh, uh, granule city sarcoma, especially, um, you know, that, uh, and also uh, neuroblastoma. So, um, so, I don't find in these pediatric patients, um, they usually get gaze-induced visual loss, but I guess it could be possible. Okay, many, most of our patients with rhabdomyosarcoma come with stage three. They initially respond very well to chemo, but stagnate at the fourth or fifth cycle. We use vancristine, nadromycin, and cyclophosphamide, and tumor starts growing, and from there is just downhill. We usually switch to IC uh, medicine, but the response has been poor. We end up losing most of our patients. Is there anything you can suggest that can improve our outcomes? Radiation has not helped these patients either. Um, well, that's 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 unusual. Um, you know, I think you know, radiation therapy would be definitely uh, helpful. Um, I mean, that's a, the exact um, right treatment. Um, some of those newer agents that I, I listed um, can also be uh, tried. You know. Um, for, for these patients that are refractory. Um, uh, I'm not really sure why you're losing your patients. Um, you know, I think, you know, giving the radiation um, uh, simultaneously with the chemotherapy, I don't know if you're uh, doing that, but, you know, we give radiation therapy at the same time as chemotherapy. And, and again, most of our patients are also stage, stage three. And so we can biopsy the tumor. We can't take it out. There's usually gross tumor left in the orbit. We uh, start them on chemotherapy and um, yeah, and usually they respond uh, pretty well combined with uh, radiation therapy. But I mean, I would be sure it is rhabdomyosarcoma. I would be sure that we, we're not missing, you know, another lesion that may have a different uh, treatment. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe try some of the other um, agents that we, we talked about as well. So let's see, did I miss anything uh, here? What is the prognosis of Ewing sarcoma with a mild metastasis to, in the liver? I think the prognosis is, is guarded. A patient would definitely need chemotherapy, um, you know, um, with mild metastasis to the liver. I think, you know, the, the prognosis with newer medications, with newer chemotherapy has improved quite a bit. It's probably, you know, 50% or, or greater. Um, and Ewing sarcoma is usually a metastatic tumor at the, uh, at the discovery. We usually, when we see it in the orbit, it's metastatic from somewhere else. It's very, very uncommon for it to be primary in the orbit. So usually, uh, statistically, I think, um, the studies I've read, there's a really good study by Jonathan Dutton in, um, in OPRS, uh, Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, where he talks all about a very, um, you know, comprehensive review of Ewing sarcoma. It's um, from several years ago. I think I actually uh, I quoted it here. Let me see if I can find that 
that uh, uh, quote for you, but it's a really nice study on Ewing sarcoma. So this is it, uh, Jonathan Dutton, um, OPRS uh, 16 for uh, 292 to 300, and that was uh, done in uh, the year 2000. So that's a really good um, study of, uh, of Ewing sarcoma. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you. We give chemotherapy separately then follow with radiation therapy. We will try giving both simultaneously. Okay, that's good. Proton Center in USA, A, please. I, I know there's one in Jacksonville, Florida. And that's one we usually use. I know there's one in Boston. Um, I think there's several, uh, you know, around the country. Um, but the one we used to use is the one in, in Florida since I'm in Miami. Um, Jacksonville is the closest place for us. Um, so uh, rhabdomyosarcoma is most common in boys. What is the age? Usually, I find the usual median age is about seven to eight years of age is the usual median age. Um, well, optic uh, pathway glioma, okay, optic pathway glioma um, treatment, you know, the, the problem with optic pathway gliomas is if you remove them at an early stage, the, the eye is blind. So we usually, we follow them along, and if they are not in, um, encroaching on the uh, optic canal or extending into the optic canal, or threatening to involve the chiasm or the other optic nerve, we usually just watch them. Um, Carefully, if they are, if the eye is blind, if there's a risk of it extending in, we usually work with neurosurgery and do a neurosurgical approach to completely, re completely resect the optic nerve um, from the canal up to the up to the back of the eye, and uh, we do that with the um, with the uh, neurosurgeon. I hope you all uh, got something out of the uh, webinar, and have a have a wonderful day. Thank you.